Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, is, is speak for, for what, about, about 45 minutes, actually, and then take a few questions afterwards, um, what you might call a live, unscripted two-way. Um, I'm perhaps quite qualified to talk about journalism tonight because I've done it for all media and I've experienced it at all levels. There is, of course, the respectable level, the Today programme, the London Evening Standard, where I'm now a reporter and a columnist, uh, Channel 4, for whom I make regular dispatches documentaries, including one uh, with a company based here in Bristol. Um, but I've also had an exciting variety of contacts with what you might call the, the other side of the business. Um, as well as the documentaries for Channel 4, I've also been a character in a drama on Channel 4 based on the Hutton Inquiry, um, I lobbied the program makers to be played by Ewan McGregor, but but you know what? They refused. Um, the day I really knew I'd arrived on the Z list, though, was when I got the offer to take part in a program called Celebrity Surgery, <laughs> described by the makers as, quotes, a natural follow-up to Channel 5's most recent medical reality show, Operations Live, offering you, underlined, the chance to be filmed undergoing a variety of cosmetic procedures <laughs> under the knife of a Harley Street plastic surgeon. <laughs> now, you know, the question I wanted to ask is, how on earth did they know I needed plastic surgery? <laughs> anyway, I, I turned them down. Um, I've been subjected to enough surgery in the media already, I think. Um, I never did get the offer from Celebrity Big Brother, alas. I, I think, I'm not sure anyone could face even the, the mental picture of me in a, a lycra cat suit. Um, but as well as seeing journalism in all media and at all levels, I see it also from both ends. I've been both reporter and reported on in one of the most intense media storms anyone has ever seen. You might remember it. Um, my thesis tonight is that that story started a period in which the media has been under sustained attack. What started out as a specific attack on a specific journalist, me, went on to become a broader attack on first the BBC's coverage of the war and then the entire BBC and then on all journalism. Um, its most persistent advocate is a man called John Lloyd who was assistant editor of the Financial Times until they unfortunately sacked him. Um, not long after the Hutton Inquiry, he wrote an important book called What the Media is Doing to Our Politics. He's now um, director of the Reuters Institute for Study of Journalism at Oxford University. And Lloyd laid out a thesis that has since been taken up enthusiastically by a number of politicians, above all, of course, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Uh, you'll remember that with his, his characteristic calm restraints and moderation, Blair, a few weeks before he left office, made a big speech attacking the media as feral beasts, tearing to shreds the reputations of honest public servants like himself in case you were wondering who he had in mind. Uh, John Lloyd, too, says in his book that the media has become reflexively cynical, untruthful, confrontational, a corrupter of public life. It is, he believes, responsible for the declining levels of trust in politicians. The media, he says, is a new power in the land, a power that is unaccountable and needs to be held to account. Uh, and John's main example, his principal villain in this, this cesspool of falsehood and distortion, is me. Um, for my story about the government's deceit over its Iraq weapons dossier. Now, I, I wouldn't make quite the grand claims for my story that some of my supporters make. It wasn't perfect. Very little journalism is perfect. It shouldn't have to be perfect. But it was both overwhelmingly in the democratic interest and overwhelmingly correct. One of the very few media stories up to that point about Iraqi WMD that was actually true. And what we now know, of course, was that, if anything, my story understated the government's duplicity. Now, the fact that John Lloyd was unfortunate enough to choose in me almost diametrically the wrong example doesn't entirely invalidate his general case, I don't think. I, I would not defend the behaviour of the press. My experience of journalism from the receiving end was, was often pretty unpleasant. I was struck by quite how frequently my journalistic critics had to distort what I'd said or done in order to be able to condemn me. 
Uh, I have to say that, that John Lloyd fell into that category in spades, but you know, he, he was only writing a book calling for journalistic accuracy. What I learned, however, during my um, media travails in 2003 was that none of this slanted journalism really mattered very much. It really didn't make much difference. For six months, Rupert Murdoch's newspapers, owned, of course, by a major business rival of the BBC, spared no ink to make me and the BBC look like pond life. Um, the Sun once gave over its entire front page to a headline uh, picture of me under the headline, You Rat. But on these streets, the taxi drivers are still refusing to take my money. The opinion polls, the Sun and Times readers, just like everybody else, overwhelmingly believed me and the BBC and overwhelmingly disbelieved the um, then Prime Minister, as they continue to do, of course. So what I learned from that is a, majority, a minority of journalists and proprietors might want to pursue their own agendas, undermine democracy, change the truth, but they have much less power to do so than they like to think. It just doesn't work if it goes against the grain of the facts. Journalism, I think, can, can amplify public feelings that already exist, but it cannot create them from scratch. And one of New Labour's greatest failings has been that it consistently overestimates the importance of the media and underestimates the intelligence of the public. We are not automatons hardwired to the sort of leader page of the Sun or the Today programme, indeed. We are sceptical distrusting consumers of the press. We make up our minds, we have our own minds, we make them up on the basis of a wide variety of sources of which the media are only one. It's argued that the media have become too disrespectful of ministers, if only that were the case. But in the run-up to the war, with honourable exceptions, the real failing of some journalists, of course, was that they obediently, respectfully, towed the government and the military line. Some of us allowed ourselves to become debriefers of the briefers or spokesmen for the spokesmen. Uh, the only stories I'm really ashamed of on today are the ones where I accepted at face value the likes of what Jack Straw and Colin Powell were telling me. That kind of journalism will never, of course, get anyone into trouble, but far more of it was inaccurate than any original story I did. So I don't think the reason the government is facing a crisis of trust and credibility has very much to do with the media. The reason the government is distrusted is because it does not tell the truth. Let's remind ourselves of the... Uh, let's leave aside Iraq for the moment. Let's remind ourselves of the overhyping which played Labour's first term. And you'll remember the £40 billion for the NHS turned out to be achieved by double and treble counting the figures. What that means is that even now the government does have real achievements to boast about. It is simply not believed. Let's remind ourselves of last week when we were told that the loss of the data records of half the population was due to the, uh, the efforts of a junior official. Uh, we then learned that, in fact, the uh, strategy for releasing the records had been cleared by uh, what was called a process manager, a uh, quite senior official. And Whitehall said, no, actually, we've, the latest we've learned is actually, no, no, when we say junior official, we mean, well, we could mean middle-ranking official as well, or indeed quite senior official. Junior official is anyone basically south of the permanent secretary. Um, that's, their, that's their argument now. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously the data thing could have happened to anyone, but it does show up a, a particular a couple of particular problems with New Labour there, complete carelessness about personal information and privacy and also their rather um, casual attitude to, um, to the truth. And then, of course, there is Iraq. And what we didn't fully comprehend until the Butler report was quite how extraordinary the government's behaviour actually was. We learned that the intelligence presented to us by the Prime Minister as detailed, authoritative and compelling was actually silo floor sweepings from second-hand sources, third-hand sources, sources reporting things they'd sort of heard from their circles of contacts. That's an actual um, phrase from the Butler report. We learned that the Prime Minister claimed there was a growing threat after he'd actually been told the threat was static or even diminishing. We learned that one of the dossier's central claims was underpinned by a source who was on trial, in the words of the Butler report, and had never been used or tested before. A secret agent on work experience. And these people presume to lecture the media on standards of accuracy? I mean, it is now clear to me, at least, that the, the legendary dossier was the rough equivalent for a journalist of writing a front-page news story based on something that your minicab driver heard down the pub in 1995. Except, of course, that no news story ever became part of a case for killing 100,000 people. It's argued that the media undermines democracy by uh, alienating and disconnecting the public 
from the political process. Quite the reverse, I think. Those of us who cover politics spend our time trying to connect people. We want people to read about politics. The reason people feel disconnected from the political process is not because of the media, it's because they are disconnected. At the last election, the government won 36% of the votes, but 55% of the seats in the House of Commons. If you factor in turnout, it actually won the positive endorsement of little more than one-fifth of the electorate, 22% to be precise. Yet that incredibly feeble popular mandate delivered tremendous power not just over things like war and peace. The issues which people care about most, of course, are extremely local, schools, crime, roads, planning, but control of all those things has been taken away from elected councillors and to Whitehall, which, in England at least, runs the most centralised and secretive large democracy in the world. So that is what undermines our democratic process, the fact that our representative democracy is not nearly representative or democratic enough. Over the question of Iraq, the most serious question you can possibly imagine, the committing of our troops to war against a country which had offered no provocation to us. Nearly all the democratic institutions which are supposed to protect us failed. The civil service, in the person of John Scarlett, chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, became Alistair Campbell's co-conspirator. Parliament, in the form of the Foreign Affairs Committee, was more concerned with trying to humiliate David Kelly than with getting to the bottom of the dossier business. And the judiciary in the form of Lord Hutton, well, I just don't know what happened to Lord Hutton. Um, Not only did the institutions fail, they have failed to acknowledge their failures. And they continue to pretend that all is well. In the US, the director of the CIA, who presented misleading intelligence, was fired. In the UK, John Scarlett has been promoted. He is now in charge of MI6. The only thing which actually, if belatedly got its act together and sort of worked eventually, the only estate of the realm which did its job with any kind of effectiveness was the fourth estate, us. It was very, very imperfect, but in the end, it worked. Um, Lloyd and his chums continue to argue that the profession is suffering a crisis of trust. Reporting, which allegedly stresses advocacy over facts, has, they say, led to a dramatic decline in the credibility of reporters. Now, um, I have had a look at this, and sadly, when you look at it, the thesis turns out to be itself a rather good example of advocacy taking preference over the facts. The only annual poll measuring the perceived truthfulness of different professions conducted by Mori for the British Medical Association and, and available on its website, if you want to look, actually shows that trust in journalists as a whole doubled between 1993 and 2006, though still only admittedly to the rather horribly low level of 20%. Even that, though, is not the full picture. The public is perfectly capable of distinguishing between different types of journalists. A YouGov poll for the Daily Telegraph in 2003 showed virtually no one, 14%, trusted red-top tabloid reporters, and who can blame them? But there were striking levels of trust in broadsheet journalists, 65%, and especially in broadcasters, up to 82%. Far more, incidentally, than ministers in the current Labour government, which is also polled, and they got 25%. Now, a similar pattern, slightly same kind of distribution, slightly lower values, um, emerged in a more recent survey carried out by the Committee in Standards on Public Life. Now, both those polls were carried out before all the TV fakery scandals, but though those were terrible self-inflicted wounds, I think, none directly affected news journalism. The, uh, The fakery will, of course, have an effect on trust, and it will deserve to. But it is still, I think, of a wholly different order than the deceit practiced by governments. So so I am proud that journalism, including my journalism, got closer to the truth more quickly over Iraq than did anything else. It's a reminder that it can still do important things. And I am pleased that the Tony Blair, John Lloyd critique of the press hasn't really taken. Yet, although they may have lost the political argument, although I don't think there's much doubt in the general public that I and the BBC were right and and the government was, was wrong and that the Um, the Iraq war was missold to us. Although they've lost the political argument, the forces of hostility to journalism have, I think, recently chalked up some arguably more significant practical victories. Take uh, leaks. They are a a mainstay of journalism, and of course one without which literally thousands of stories in the public interest would never have been told. But over the last two years, there's been quite a serious clampdown on unapproved official information. Civil servants, diplomats and soldiers have been placed under new obligations not to write memoirs. 
and are being required to assign their copyright in any they do write to the government. Uh, leakers of, of prima facie public interest material have been prosecuted, convicted, and even jailed with remarkably little fuss from the media. In 1984, you might remember, the trial of Clyde Ponting for leaking the Belgrano documents became a cause celeb, hugely covered in the press and resulting in Ponting's acquittal. But earlier this year, in an exactly parallel case, two men, David Keogh and Joe O'Connor, were sent to prison for leaking a copy of a memo in which George Bush and Tony Blair discussed, ironically, bombing a TV station in Al Jazeera. That trial went virtually unreported, partly because the judge banned anyone from reporting the contents of the memo, even though though it was public knowledge. And again, nobody really made a fuss about that. Another man, Derek Pascal, is currently awaiting trial for leaking memos to the um, New Statesman's Martin Bright, detailing the the complicity of the government with the Muslim Council of Britain, memos whose publication led to a major change in government policy. Now, neither of those leaks jeopardised national security. There were classic political embarrassment uses of the Official Secrets Act. But the almost total lack of protest from the media has sent a chilling message to potential future leakers. You are on your own. And not only have leakers started being arrested, so have the journalists they leak to. Three weeks ago, a reporter on the Milton Keynes citizen, Sally Murrah, was charged with abetting misconduct in public office an offence which carries a potential jail sentence. Her alleged crime was to have received leaked information from a police officer uh, about uh, the staff at the central police station at Milton Keynes losing the keys to the cells. Her home and the offices of her newspaper were searched, her DNA was taken, and she was locked up for the night in the cells. Now, if only any journalist who had allegedly received leaked information from a police officer were, was arrested, there wouldn't be many of us left. Maybe that's what they want. Um, Let's remember another um, police leak, a rather important one, the story broken by ITV News that Jean-Charles de Menezes had not, as the police claimed, been running away when he was shot, that he had not, as the police claimed, had on a heavy coat, and that he was not, in fact, um, offering any resistance. He was being held down, in fact, when he was shot and seven bullets were pumped into his head. Critical details from a leaked IPCC, Independent Police Complaints Commission report, which had until that point been secret and which electrified the whole de Menezes story. The ITN journalist who received that leak and the IPCC secretary who leaked it to him were arrested. To this day, to this day, they remain the only two people to have been arrested in connection with the death of Jean-Charles de Menezes. Not the officers who killed him, not the police commissioner who misled us, but the journalist who exposed the untruths. So journalists, I think, are very far from immune from the, from the creeping growth of, of state power that we're now seeing in Britain. The police and the authorities have far greater powers than they used to have to demand material, obtain telephone and email data, seize and search, and they are using them more and more. They've even started blanching out the police into uh, TV criticism. Witness the, uh, the recent quite extraordinary decision by West Midlands Police to report the programme I work on, Dispatches, although not an edition I did, as it happens, to Ofcom for what it claimed were systematic distortions in the editing of uh, an expose of Muslim extremists in Birmingham. There weren't, of course, any, any such distortions as Ofcom has just found. But even if there had been, it is the responsibility of the police to investigate crime, not editorial standards in television. Nor are the courts... I don't think always terribly helpful. Mr Justice Eady, the man who hears most libel cases in the uh, High Court, is developing a clear track record of favouring the privacy provisions of the Human Rights Act over the ones guaranteeing freedom of expression. Uh, I, you know, I could tell you quite a lot of stories about the things he's banned, but I probably would be locked up if I did that. Among the stories he's ruled must be kept secret, uh, one which involves a man describing how a very well-known public figure, a, a political figure we'd all know, Uh, stole his wife. Individually, none of these things are particularly serious. Collectively, they represent a real tightening of the strings around journalism's neck. But I haven't yet come to the most serious part of the attack on journalism, from within the media industry itself. What's happened over the last 20 years, broadly since Rupert Murdoch's move to Wapping, is that it's become possible to make money from newspapers. Because of the print unions, it never used to be. 
Newspapers weren't really proper businesses. People owned them not for profit but for prestige or influence. Suddenly, almost overnight, with the print unions taken out of the equation, the newspapers became increasingly profitable, incredibly profitable, actually. They started to be treated like any other business. So owners were able to do the usual things, consolidations, mergers, squeezing costs, takeovers. And, of course, there were plenty of costs to be squeezed. Uh, There was a lot of waste. But a lot of the owners, I'm thinking, say, of Trinity Mirror, didn't know where to stop. They got greedy. Even though they were making very good profits from their newspapers, they wanted to make more and more. And by that time, they were cutting into the bone. And often, with managers who seem to regard journalism as very little different from any other consumer product, like washing machines or cars... So over the last 20 years, we've seen a dramatic decline in the number of of reporting journalists, but a dramatic increase in the amount of space they have to fill. They have to do far more stories with far less time on each story. Producing a car in less time might be a good idea. It's a standard product. It's easy to check whether or not it works. It probably does make it cheaper. But journalism, of course, is not a standard product. And producing journalism in less time risks fundamentally altering its nature. Because at the same time as the number of journalists has shrunk, the number of anti-journalists, if you like, has risen to fill the gap. If you were writing a story about a hospital, you used to be able to speak to the manager or the consultant. Um, If you were writing about a crime, you used to be able to speak to the investigating officer in charge. Now, however, of course, you have to speak to the PR. And every organisation, private and public, has seen a massive increase in this army of anti-journalists. And increasingly, because we are so seen on the ground and so overstretched, they're not just managing contact with the media. They are shaping the content of the media. They are writing the newspapers. Because we, the hacks, often don't have time to do much more than process what they give us. And that might help explain why, to begin with, we did so badly over Iraq. Um, I think um, uh, most journalists want two things. They want stories and they want other people to follow up their stories. And, uh, and the government PRs knew that. They, uh, they provided um, juicy stories. There was a great one in the Sunday Telegraph where I used to work. This is after I'd left, um, about the belly dancers of death. Anyone remember that one? Um, this was that a, uh, a secret operation codenamed Operation Falcon, according to Western intelligence sources, um, were, had, um, was aiming to fan out highly trained um, Iraqi killer agents disguised as actresses and belly dancers into the streets of London to uh, kill and maim dissidents. And, you know, this complete load of old drivel was um, swallowed wholesale by the Sunday Times because they knew, Sunday Telegraph, because they knew that, um, they knew that, uh, that it would be confirmed the following day by the foreign officers that duly was and it would be followed up um, as it duly was by other newspapers. And that, for that particular journalist who wrote that story, became his definition of truth. The fact is it just wasn't in his interest to do the, the routine journalistic checks that would have exposed that um, story as a nonsense it was because it was a story it was going to be confirmed. Um, I, um, I was on the BBC at that, uh, by that point and I, uh, I was invited to follow it up by my editor. I rang the, um, the Home Office actually and asked how many visas have been granted for Iraqi belly dancers in the last 15 years and they said none. <laughs> how many visas have been granted for any kind of belly dancers and they said one. Um, and uh, so, you know, um, so I don't think that, that, that that's the kind of thing uh, I'm talking about. And increasingly, um, what we're finding is official sources are not just sources of news, they're also arbiters of news. Because if you do a story on your own, if you do the work, you do an investigation, um, you, you, you beaver away for, for weeks on your own, you come up with a great story. The fact is, uh, it might be rather inconvenient to those in power. Uh, it will often be denied. It will not be followed up by your colleagues. And you need exceptional determination in a newspaper, or more um, importantly, with exceptional determination to keep it going. The Guardian's expose of BAE's bribery was one such example. They had to keep plugging away at that you know, pretty much every week for literally months before anyone else took it up because it was denied and denied and denied. Um, and only very, very few newspapers have the kind of determination shown by the Guardian on that story, a determination which eventually, but only eventually, paid off. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, with the way journalism is going, the economics is only going to become more difficult. We see, of course, the rise of the web. In some ways, it's a very good thing. It democratizes information. It's an immensely important research tool for journalists. You can get reports and information that would take you weeks to get previously. You can get them in in a few hours. Um, 
However, it does mean clearly, it, quite clearly, is draining money out of journalism. It's much harder to make money um, from, from a web-based product than a print-based one, and that means fewer reporters. And it also means, frankly, less authoritative reporters. We talk about citizen journalism, and that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I'm a citizen as well. And, um, uh, and I happen to think, along with the uh, Guardian reporter David Lee, that we do need to... We do need to make the point that not all voices are equal in this debate. Not all voices are equal. Some, some voices have more skill uh, at investigating than others. Some voices have more knowledge and specialist expertise than others. Those voices um, should be heard more than others. It's, it's not some, journalism is not something that anyone can just walk in off the street and do straight away and be brilliant at straight away. Um, so, I mean, what's the answer? I mean, I can tell you what's not the answer. I went to a conference of media workers against the war last week, and, uh, and literally after uh, virtually every questioner slagging off state lies for question after question, and they all went on to say, well, actually, the answer is a state watchdog to enforce accuracy on the media. Well, I'm sorry, you know, I mean, there's a, obviously a fundamental contradiction there. Um, a state watch would, would end up being an absolute albatross round our necks, as would any form of... Of, of press regulation, which is sometimes suggested by the kind of Roy Greenslade, John Lloyd school of, uh, of affairs. Um, the answer, I think, is, is that we ourselves, as journalists, have got to stand up for journalism, rather as the uh, defence chiefs have finally started to stand up for their troops, which they've done it a bit earlier. Uh, we've got to start saying to our employers and the world, we can't go on like this, we can't work properly like this. The union, I think, the NEJ, is very important, both in defending jobs and quality where they're at risk, as, of course, at the BBC at the moment and in ITV regional news. Um, it's absolutely vital that the struggle against cuts at the BBC is, is waged and won. I think there's a reasonable chance, because it's a very heavily unionised workplace, uh, there's quite a lot of, uh, of anger there. It's been extremely badly handled by the management, um, and uh, a lot of people are very, very unhappy. Uh, there is no doubt at all that cutting jobs out of BBC... There's no doubt at all there's huge waste in the BBC. I mean, I used to walk around when I worked there, the upper reaches of TV centre, marvelling at the kind of sheer lunacy of the job titles uh, on, the, on the offices and the upper floors, sort of director of paperclips resource marketing, and, you know, and it's just amazing. But actually, in the, in the bits that actually did the work... They were, you know, they, they were incredibly over They're always all filthy. They never got clean. Today's studio, the t today office never, ever got clean because it's a 24-hour operation. The cleaners could never get in. And there are all these hollow-eyed 25-year-olds on 25 grand a year working 12-hour days. And literally, um, uh, we had 55 people on today to produce 17 hours of radio a week. And um, we, couldn't, you know, we couldn't play any records. We couldn't take any phone calls. We had to produce all that, all that radio ourselves. Um, and... Uh, and very often we, we nearly didn't make it. Very, very often we were like literally one 22-year-old production assistant from falling off air. Um, and uh, it all sounds very smooth on the surface. It's incredibly panic-stricken and crisis-ridden underneath. And that was a flagship program. God knows what, what the rest are like. So there's, there's not a great deal of slack in uh, BBC journalism. There's a great deal of slack elsewhere in the BBC. Uh, but that is not the slack that's being attacked. Uh, so that's what the union, that's probably the most important thing the union can do. Um, but also the other thing which it do more of, it really needs to do more of, is, is build links with other organisations such as Liberty, where we share common interests. Uh, it's quite clear, for instance, a threat to, to human rights and fundamental liberties in this country um, is... is is a threat. You know, journalists used to assume they were journalists used to assume they were kind of, to some extent, protected from this, protected from being arbitrarily arrested when they were covering demonstrations or whatever. But increasingly, that's no longer the case. So we quite clearly share the interests of the general public in living in a free society. Um, I think it is possible to roll back elements of state power. I think we're, look, we're seeing it now. Actually, the government's having a great deal more difficulty than it expected bringing in its extended detention powers. Um, our formal democratic structures may be pretty rubbish, but our civil society, our informal means of pressure, including, above all, most importantly of all, the press, are strong. Um, what I think we also need, and maybe the union can help here, is um, a newspaper or a magazine about the press, you know, reporting about reporting. We need to turn the spotlight on ourselves. We need, to, we need a sort of, I don't know, a weekly or a monthly publication that will kind of expose, mock, and humiliate the bad. Um, 
forensically investigate dodgy stories, uh, shame people, make it very difficult for them to do, you know, uh, root out some of the dodgy practices that absolutely plague our trade, nepotism things. I mean, I, 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 I can't tell you how many people called Dimbleby there are working at the BBC, about 15. Um, <laughs> and also we need to uh, celebrate the good um, because... You know, the best answer to bad journalism is not state regulation, I think. The best answer to bad journalism is good journalism. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, lady in the middle there. Yeah, you're holding the microphone, yeah. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Susie Weldon from the Western Daily Press. Um, I just want to say I really enjoyed your lecture and I agreed with everything you said in the last points about some of the remedies. But speaking as someone who works in the regional press and has recently been through redundancy process and has seen firsthand the pressures, the increasing pressures that are being placed upon um, journalists out of the greed of newspaper proprietors, I suppose I've become increasingly despondent about journalism's ability to withstand the economic pressures and I just wonder what you, you think of that, because it just seems to me that they are cutting even further into the bone, and I truly don't see how anyone has time to do more than recycle press releases. Yeah, the situation in the regional press is, is probably the most serious, actually, of anywhere in the media. Um, uh, because what we have here are newspaper groups, including my own sister group, Northcliffe Newspapers, which owns the, your paper, right? Um, you know, they make substantial profits. From, uh, from their papers. I'm not sure what Northcliffe's profits are, but I know Trinity Mirror's regional profit is it's 9% or something year on year, which is a very, very good profit. Um, but they want more and more. Um, I, I mean, I hate to say this, but um, the, the, the most important weapon you have is the, to withdraw your labour. Um, and I know the trouble is it's very difficult to get people organised in journalism. It's not, um, it's not a... Uh, a trade, and this is one of the things I should probably have mentioned in my speech, it's not a trade that's particularly big on solidarity. Um, it's composed of very, um, you know, individualistic people, and of course to some extent you have to be to be a journalist, you have to be quite um, uh, self-centred even. Um, and one of the things I noticed when I was, uh, was, when I was in trouble over Hutton was, was how few journalists were, you know, I mean, actually, quite a few journalists were prepared to come to my support, but quite a few were, were deeply hostile and critical, and a lot of others just enjoyed the spectacle and started piling in. And I thought that was silly. That wasn't in their own interest either, because it was the whole of journalism that was under attack. Um, it, it would have had implications for them if the attack they were mounting on us had succeeded. Um, so, I mean, I think that, I'm afraid, I, I, I can't see many other ways in which you can bring pressure to bear on your employers. Um, and, uh, and it will soon come to reach a critical stage. Um, uh, I, I know that's probably, it's, it's probably quite a big step for anyone to take, but, uh, but somebody needs to make a stand for editorial quality, um, because very soon, you're, you're right, you will be re reduced to reprocesses of press releases. I'd um, like to... Um, yeah, sorry. I'd like to just put a bit of background in there to say that here in Bristol we have been really well organised um, in the newspaper... But the difficulty with organising and withdrawing labour is, is one of regulation Absolutely, as much yeah. as every, yeah. anything else. I mean, Susie yeah. and her colleagues and others in Bristol have gone right to the wire on trying to get that sorted out. Absolutely, and, yeah. and what stops people isn't solidarity within the workplace, which is very... In Bristol, we have the only NUJ chapel in any, any, in any Northcliffe newspaper in the country, I think, apart from Leicester. So it's exceptional here, but um, it just hasn't been possible to do to, to create strikes because of the, because of the anti-strike legislation and the anti-union legislation. So you know, no, I know I, I, I fully understand the difficulties. I mean, I, I work for a um, one of the other things I do is I work for an Iranian TV channel called Press TV, um, and uh, and and they are um, uh, in negotiations with them. Um, the NUJ at the moment, um, and you know, industrial relations legislation makes it quite difficult and cumbersome to get organised there. Um, there is one other possible avenue, um, if the law makes it too difficult, um, which is the kind of sort of public humiliation avenue. Um, uh, now, it's difficult 
to bring enough pressure to bear on people. But again, I mean, the, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in the power of focused information. I think that's probably potentially a huge force, a, a huge force for change in our society. Too many people um, think about protest in terms of demonstrations and petitions. Now, you know, frankly, when was the last demonstration or petition that ever achieved anything? I mean, even the biggest demonstration in British history didn't achieve anything. Um, we have to think of new ways to, um, to, to protest. And, and one of the best ways is to dig out information that is deeply embarrassing to people in power, makes them change their minds, brings enough pressure on them to change their minds. Um, and as, as journalists, of course, we are professionals at digging out information. So that shouldn't be impossible for us. Um, I, I couldn't help thinking, for instance, I remember during railway privatisation, I thought, you know, if somebody had kind of given me a year off, I could, you could see the railway privatisation being a total disaster coming around, down the track. I know quite a lot about the railways. Um, and I, I, I kind of thought at the time, I thought, half thought, why don't I get someone like the Roundtree Trust to pay me, you know, I don't know, X amount of money, and I can take a year off from the paper, and I can actually just do, spend the full time, a sort of forensic investigation job on all the, all the impossibilities of railway privatisation and, and, and try and you know, get contacts in the whole area and bring out embarrassing documents. And it, it might have been possible with a really focused campaign to derail that. There is, there's quite a lot of stuff you can do. I mean, um, I remember when we were, um, we were campaigning against changes to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, David Lee and I and uh, Rob Evans, David's um, sort of oppo at The Guardian, and, and several other people did a kind of sort of... Um, quite a focused campaign of articles and exposés and things um, digging out information um, that proved the government was acting for totally cynical motives. And it did have an effect, actually. They did back down. They, they actually backed down. The, they, they decided not to, uh, to restrict the Freedom of Information Act in the way that they had been proposing. But you need to kind of coordinate it, just, not just the release of information, but also then coordinate it with you know, questions to um, draw, draw up questions for sympathetic MPs, early day motions, kind of, you know, bring all the political pressure together. And that can have a tremendous impact if it's done properly and coordinated properly. So that is another potential route. Um, and that's what I mean by saying that the, the NUJ should be, more, should be more into that kind of thing. I know it's, it's a resource thing, but, it sh but that's the kind of thing it should be doing because it, ha it can have a tremendous effect. This is not, you know, wh however we may moan, this is not um, a dictatorship. There, is, there, are, there are avenues of civil society, there are levers you can pull, uh, and they can be pulled to effect. Any more questions? Yeah, man in the middle there. I would like to speak as a member of the public that has other concerns than freedom of information or the freedom of the press and expression. I've been much involved with um, special interest campaign groups, which um, particularly in the field of development and planning, and uh, trying to reverse the balance between the rights of the individual and in small communities and the very wealthy development industry which has unlimited resources to fight and of course the, the law itself, planning law is loaded against um, uh, the, the ordinary individual and the ordinary community um, we had a, a series of lectures off campus in the university some years ago given by George Monbiot who has, done, has written as you know some very good case histories of the um, mis mis maladministration. And um, in the end, we asked George Monbiot how we could improve our performance in getting the media to take up the issues which, we, which concerned us. And George said, well, you've got to actually learn how the media works and get alongside um, reporters and give them useful information. Yeah. Now, um, if you receive such um, involvement, can you, in the industry, in the, in, the, in the actual activity of producing newspapers, have you got, is, is it effective to have that sort of 
It, um, it absolutely rapport. is. Yeah. No, it absolutely is. I mean, that, that's one of the things. I mean, you know, PRs and things don't just have to work for the forces of evil. They could work for you. And actually, uh, one of the things, one of the things it might be useful to do in the defence of journalism, as in this cause that you're talking about, is to uh, is to actually have a full time person. I mean, someone like Andrew Green of Migration Watch. Now, Andrew Green of Migration Watch is Migration Watch is just Andrew Green. There's there's, there's hardly anybody else. You ring them and he answers the phone, um, which is a bit of a come down really for the former ambassador to Saudi Arabia answering the phone but nonetheless but nonetheless simply on his own by just being there being a spokesman on 24 hour call for the media he has managed to propel the issue of migration not an issue I, I mean you know his take on it is not one I share in any way but he has managed to propel that issue right up to the top of the engine now if there was someone to talk about developer power or bad journalism or, or media attacks or, or you know or, or useless media owners on a 24/7 basis who could who could go on news 24 at five seconds notice and talk about it that would rise the issue up the political agenda and and actually when you mentioned about developer power you are you're talking my language because I did a dispatches on this um, in July July the 30th which is fantastic Fascinating stuff. I mean, um, I remember we, we, we found some extraordinary stuff going on. We found a, a, um, there's, there's a the lobbying firm called PPS, based in London, which, which works in this rather specialised branch of, 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 of the PR industry, which is basically if you want to build a, you know, a, a, an Asda in Salisbury Cathedral close, they're the people you get. Uh, they will help you get planning permission for any difficult scheme, and they will stop at nothing. And we found, um, we found a scheme in Fulham, actually, called Imperial Wharf, by a big developer, we found um, uh, we, we found that they had bugged uh, meetings of local councillors, private meetings. We found they had gone round um, to to the councillors pretending to be students, um, researching a PhD thesis to find out what they thought about the uh, development. We found they had faked letters. We, we ran around several. We got all the letters they that had been written to the council in support of it. It was it was funny. I mean, I spoke to one of the councillors and said, you know, everyone's normally against um, these kind of things, but we just suddenly got this stream of about 50 letters all saying how wonderful it was. And we got some of the letters, and they were ludicrous. And they said things like, you know, what is wrong with you councillors? Get on with this scheme at once. And, you know, the sort of thing that nobody would say, even if they were, you know, nobody in this country. And, and you know, anyway, so we thought, right, well, let's go and have a look at some, see some of these letters. We went round, round to see the people whose names are on the letters and whose signatures are on the letters, and they said they'd never seen them in their lives. Either they'd signed completely different letters saying they were against a, a scheme, and their signature had been cut and pasted onto, uh, on, onto one saying they were in favour, or they hadn't signed anything at all. We found one guy who said he was in the Caribbean for the whole six months when he didn't even know it was happening. Um, and uh, so that was fun. Um, and, uh, and of course the, the, the lobbying company kind of really harumphed and threatened to sue us and send writs and so forth so far um, and it's what three months on now, four months on uh, they, haven't, they haven't sent anything so, uh, so I take it um, they're not going to uh, but no, I mean they have, you have, they have tremendous power but you have also a considerable advantage in almost in your lack of professionalism because you are seen to be the people and you know the, the public will take your side and newspaper readers will like reading about you. You have to combine, if you like, professionalism and amateurism. You have to you have to present the face of amateurs, but you have to present yourselves professionally and uh, and you know be available, for instance, a journalist and and work out stories that they will be interested in. And there can be incredibly fruitful um, relationships between journalists and members of uh, community groups and pressure groups because some of the best stories come from people like that who are on the ground. Now I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying at all by the way that we should um, take these stories without checking. I think quite often community groups have uh, problematic agendas of their own um, and, and they'll want to push things a bit too far does not uh, uh, excuse me of my professional obligation to, to check, just as it wouldn't excuse me of my professional obligation to check a press release from, you know, Bristol City Council or something. But, uh, but, but there can be very fruitful relationships. I'll give you another example. We found uh, we're, um, there's a very good group in uh, Essex called Stop Standard Expansion who have really got this um, strategy right down to a T. And uh, after I did this program about the fake letters, they rang up. Um, and said, uh, we think we've got something like that in Stansted. You come down and have a look. And, and indeed, they had. Now, you know, 
well, I couldn't have found those letters in a million years because I've had to look through every... Uh, they'd written loads of, loads of fake letters that appeared in local newspapers saying the Stansted expansion's a wonderful thing. And uh, I, I, I would never have spotted that in a million years, but it was something they could spot, and they knew the journalist to call, and they called me, and I, I came and did it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good idea, and there's, 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 some, there's some really quite good books. There's a very old one by a man called Dennis McShane, who used to be an NUJ official and used to be rather a good guy, and, of course, now... Um, was then became a Labour minister um, and is now a backbench MP. It's called Using the Media. If you can find it, it's extremely good, actually. Um, a really good template for how to uh, get, get your stuff into the media. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Yeah. A lot of us rather get the uncomfortable feeling that there is a, a, a sort of collective agenda going on which is coming from the intelligence services that is threading through things. I've heard from an ex-MI5 officer uh, that um, Tony Blair was registered with the intelligence services before he ever became leader of the Labour Party. Um, and, of course, intelligence services benefit greatly when there is a war going on because they are supposed to be uh, secretly uh, defending our national interests. So I was wondering if you'd like to make a comment on that. Um, I don't know if any of you saw a very interesting piece in the New Statesman by David Rose, um, correspondent on The Observer, about six weeks ago, end of September type time, um, and, uh, and it's well worth looking up on the website of the, of the New Statesman if you want to look for it. Um, uh, essentially, he says um, that the intelligence services pretty much do as you say. They, they, they do follow a political agenda. They do try and influence the political debate by briefing selected journalists uh, and often briefing misleadingly. And the problem with um, intelligence sources is that you can't, you know, you have to take what they say on trust. You can't, you know, by, almost by definition, you can't verify secret intelligence, which is why I never really did, I mean, bother to do, to get, in, to get involved with uh, intelligence services and official level. And there were people there. I mean, both of the intelligence agencies, MI5 and MI6, have um, spokespeople uh, who, uh, who, uh, who, whose numbers I had um, and uh, who would make themselves available to select a journalist of whom I was one. Um, uh, and they would take you out to, uh, to uh, lunch and things, and they would pay. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, all here, it's all there in Rose's piece, actually. Now, they never took me out to lunch, but I did ring them occasionally to, uh, to, to check things. Um, uh, but, but there were a number of journalists of whom David Rose is one, Con Coughlin on The Telegraph is another, um, who became rather uncritical recipients of um, what can only be described as intelligence service spin. Uh, that story I mentioned to you about the belly dancers of death, although it's got somebody else's name on that, came from Con Coughlin, and it came from, um, I don't know exactly who, but it came from some intelligence service person. Um, equally, there was another case I remember about... Uh, Colonel Gaddafi's son, which ended up in court. Now, Con, that was a Con Coughlin story. He sourced it to banking sources, but actually it came out in court that his source on that was MI6. And the story was completely wrong, and it had been planted by MI6 as part of a campaign to destabilise Gaddafi, who was an enemy at that point, although, of course, he's now best chums. Um, so, um, so there's no doubt at all that the, the intelligence services use the media. I think it's a bit subtler than you say. I mean, it's, I don't think they actually wanted a war. I think they... I think they were rather horrified, to be honest, the way they got drawn in in the end. Um, they allowed themselves, I think they realise, well, I know they realised that it was a serious mistake to allow themselves to be drawn in this political arena in that sort of way, but they nonetheless do have, um, they are not beyond, um, you know, manipulating the media through briefings of selected journalists, which you either have to take or leave, and all too many journalists do, do take them, of course. We, saw, we, 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 we see that, we, we continue to see that in the... All, all the response about 7-7, um, seven, seven, the, uh, the, the, the claims made by intelligence sources in the aftermath of that all nearly all been exposed as untrue. They, they, you know, the, the claim, for instance, that the bombers were not known to the intelligence service, that's been exposed definitively as untrue. So, um, I mean, basically, yeah, I mean, too many journalists talk to intelligence sources, too many journalists believe what they hear. Now, I, you know, I talk to them, but I, I take what they say with a big pinch of salt. Yeah, at the front. Sorry. Oh, someone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. Right, at the right back. Um, I haven't personally done any work at all on the 9/11 um, alternative theories. Let me not call them conspiracy theories. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, to be honest, without actually going and looking at it in any detail, I can't, I, can't, I can't know whether the official accounts are credible or not, and I never have looked. Yeah, I mean this. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, all, all I can say is I have never looked at it. Um, all right. Okay. Next question. Another another one from the front there. No. Yeah. You said something about good journalism and bad journalism. I think that it's an important distinction because I think that um, uh, there's an important ro- role, investigative role of the journalist. There's also the role where, unfortunately journalists um, are disseminating the, the, a lot of misinformation uh, and there's also I think a lot of um, mediocre journalism where they're clearly feeding out what's coming in uh, from Migration Watch is a very good example um, and I wondered um, in a sense it follows from the question up there but I wonder what the, the role is of the uh, of the employer uh, and how hidebound um, you know the journalist is it does depend to some extent on the employer and I'm afraid like I said there are increasing numbers of employers who, who see journalism as just another product and they don't really mind what sort of comes off the production line so long as it sort of approximately looks alright um, and there's an awful lot of journalism Nick Davis, the Guardian um, journalist one of the relatively few people left who's still doing classic investigative journalism got a very good book coming out called Flat Earth News about this um, and, and about how, how things that kind of become conventional wisdom without any real back you know, any, any real backing to them. Um, they just become conventional wisdom because they've, they've been reported and then somebody else reports and somebody else reports it and it becomes the accepted norm. And obviously the presence of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction was one such conventional wisdom. Um, uh, and, um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, that's a real problem because the trouble is, unfortunately, um, going beyond the accepted norm and the conventional wisdom does take time and it does take resources and it's not going to... You know, it's not necessarily going to make you popular. It's not necessarily going to win you readers because um, the public is as prey to conventional wisdom as, 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 as many journalists. And, um, and, uh, and you've got to have a, a media owners who believe in you know, being unpopular and who believe in kind of upsetting the traces a bit. There aren't very many of those left. I mean, um, uh, there are still some in the local media, I think, but they're becoming a very endangered species there. It's probably, a, I'd say... Some also in the national media, probably a slightly higher proportion, but um, but but not enough. I mean, I, I do think I I do think we need to sort of create, as I said before, a sort of migration watch type organisation to sort of up the pressure for good journalism. Um, and so an Andrew Green type figure who can go, well, actually this story is totally untrue, and here's why. Um, and uh, or somebody who can say, look, it's completely wrong. Uh, for the Western Morning News to be cutting all these jobs because, you know, the, the, a newspaper that used to be produced with X people is now only produced with half that number and it cannot possibly be as good. And sort of that, that's probably the only way it's going to work. It's not necessarily going to work from within. Because unfortunately, the other thing is, I mean, you know, what we learn, I mean, I mean, I happen to work for a group and, um, that is, I work for the Evening Standards, part of the evil associated empire, but um, actually the standards are not that evil and... Uh, is a bit evil, but not that evil. And um, uh, and also, the um, Associated does believe whatever you say about it in journalism. They do invest heavily in journalism. That's one of the great strengths. And they do pay journalists properly. And they do give them time to do, uh, to, to do their work. And you know, I have I have a, a great deal of freedom at the stand for which I'm very grateful. Um, so, uh, and. Uh, unfortunately, though, um, it's not always the case that investment. It, it is the case in the in the in, in say the Mail versus Express market, where the, the Mail has clearly massively outtrumped the Express with the, through investment in journalism. But it's not always the case that investment in journalism leads to uh, leads to inevitably to higher sales. Um, so it's something that has it's it's, it's you know it's, it's something that has to be pressure has to be applied through more than purely commercial means because um, it's not always in employers' self-interest to invest in journalism. Also, to add to that, just to say that the NUJ has been campaigning for a while now for a conscience clause, 
And there's also an ethics council within the union which looks at these questions all the time. So there is work going on. How effective it is is another matter because we have big Who's forces. Next? Yeah. I'd like to ask you a question about the, the use of language. As somebody who's been referred to as a, a rat by a, a leading national newspaper, um, and very, taking in, into, into account the Hutton Inquiry and the fact that apparently uh, a particular word that was used that affected Stephen Ke- Kelly's state of mind very seriously was the word chaff. He was referred to as chaff, by, not by the media, but by um, a Labour politician. And um, he was also said, according to his wife, that he felt that he was being treated as a fly. And this also, this, this choice of this word fly, apparently affected his state of mind very seriously. So I was wondering, as somebody who's been referred to by another animal, rather larger, uh, whether you had any views on whether the, 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 how, what good practice would be in terms of the choice of this type of language, these sorts of metaphors, by the media. Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, Clearly, those, that, those, both those epithets you referred to weren't, um, weren't applied to David Kelly by the media, as you say. Um, I think, I, I must admit, I thought, I, I mean, w- when I heard that David had killed himself, I was absolutely, obviously, horrified, but also very surprised, because um, I thought he was a, a very tough sort of guy. He'd been a weapons inspector in Iraq, for God's sake. I mean, he'd been up against worse people than Alistair Campbell. And I'd been... You know, I've been many times to Iraq under Saddam myself, and I knew how difficult it could get. And um, and I thought, um, so what, what happened here? And I, uh, um, uh, but but I, I started to realise um, that that David, in some ways, although very scientifically sophisticated, wasn't politically um, was politically um, a lot a lot less um, experienced. Um, and uh, finding himself in this horrendous Westminster maelstrom with kind of Evil insults being thrown around, or you know, uh, against him and me and all, all the rest of it. Now, I, you know, I could kind of cope with that, frankly. I mean, I didn't like it, but I, you know, I knew it was just politics. I knew that, you know, it was you know, it was Westminster chess beating, really. Didn't you know? Somebody, you know, Trevor Kavanagh says I'm the worst journalist in the history of creation. You know, Trevor Kavanagh's never even met me. And you know, as for Trevor Kavanagh, it's politically the son, by the way, I was Trevor Kavanagh being entitled to call anyone a bad journalist. Well, I think, you know, I mean, it's satirical. I mean, so you know, it never really bothered me when the son slagged me off and stuff like that because I knew it was all just Westminster games. But I think he didn't realise it was, and and he took it very, very, um, very much to heart. Um, when the government, you know, the, the government broke a number of promises to him. Of course, they said he wouldn't be, his name wouldn't be made public. It was. They said he wouldn't have to appear in public. He did. They uh, deliberately belittled him uh, in his status. Um, they said he was a junior employee, which simply wasn't true, uh, and uh, another junior employee. Um, and uh, I see we've got a lot of those. And um, so, so I can see, I can see why it was so upsetting for him. Um, uh, I do, by the way, in case anyone wants to ask. I do believe he committed suicide. I don't think uh, that the question... I know this is quite interesting evidence um, brought out by, uh, by Norman Baker, MP, who I know very well and, and like. And Norman came to me, actually, when he was researching the book and said, I, th- I don't think he committed suicide. And I said, actually, I do, because the, the question I keep coming back to is in whose interest could it possibly have been to murder him? The fact is, you know, it, his death plunged the British government into the worst crisis he's ever faced, a crisis from which he still hasn't really recovered, so it simply wouldn't have been in their interest to murder him, even if you do believe, as I do not, in fact, that they are in the habit of going around popping off their own employees in the middle of fields in Oxfordshire. I think they'd have done it a lot more neatly than that, um, and a lot more quietly, and a, a time of, of a lot less if they wanted to. Uh, you know, um, so, so that's my thing on, um, on Kelly, but I agree with you. I mean, um, you know, political language, I think, you know, sometimes there does need to be... Um, Harshness in political language, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, not all of Blair's feral beast's critique was totally, totally ill-deserved. And sometimes, you know, he said that, you know, every setback from the, for the government's always depicted as a kind of total catastrophe. And, of course, you know, the trouble is when you, when you kind of crank up the register every single time, you, you lose, you know, you can't tell when it's really a total catastrophe and you can't tell when it isn't and it's just a, a minor catastrophe. Um, so, uh, so there is a danger in using overinflated language on both sides of the political divide. Yeah. You've mentioned that, like, the Freedom of Information Act has become very important to a journalist. What do you think turned the Labour government from passing the Freedom of Information Act to now being against journalists, to be briefing against them? 
Um, what do you reckon it was that turned the Labour government? I'm afraid it's the old um, difference between opposition and government. Oppositions, all oppositions, are full of um, wonderful progressive ideas um, to uh, distrib- redistribute power and information to other people because they haven't got power and information at that point and, uh, and they, they, believe in, uh, they, you know, they believe in all these progressive things. And then suddenly you get into, into power and you find, well, actually, I've got the power. Uh, you know, actually, I think I'm quite good at holding on to power. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a very good guardian of being in power. I don't really need to redistribute it to all these other people. It's going to cause me a lot of problems, actually. Um, and I'm afraid it's a bit, you know, the Labour Party made this progressive commitment to FOI when it was in opposition. Position, and it was one of these things that, it, that Blair didn't really want to do. I think a little bit like um, the Scottish Parliament, actually, um, uh, didn't really want to do the Human Rights Act, but he was kind of stuck with them. He committed to them very publicly. He couldn't go back on them. So what they did, in fact, was they implemented it in a, in a pretty grudging way. I don't know if you remember that they actually took more than five years to, um, to, to actually bring the bill before Parliament, and, uh, and, they, and, and when they did so, it was significantly less comprehensive than had originally been promised. And as you say, they tried to water it down again um, have, uh, when they'd been in power for a bit longer and, and they were beaten back by a coalition of the media because they were weaker at that point. They didn't have the power that they once had um, uh, and they, you know, they couldn't get away with what they once could get away with. Ah, one more at the back, yeah. Just asking about what, how do you feel... Uh, trade unions get how do you feel trade unions get reported within the media uh, locally I'd say recently the Evening Post done a very good job with the Keynesham uh, situation and obviously the home care uh, situation residential and the home care and homes it was, quite, it was quite a big dispute we're in that but it just picked up on public interest and your point I just want to know who's doing the gatekeeping about who actually gets on the 24-hour news or in, within the papers. You say about Migration Watch, that's like a one-band operation. But there's plenty of trade unionists and trade unions who actually represent millions or hundreds of thousands of members, and they're just seen as a sectional sort of interest, whereas actually they're representing a whole widespread of people, and there seems to be a you know, sort of dislack of trust sometimes. I just want to know your views yeah, th- there's no doubt at all that trade unions get far less coverage than they used to. Um, the post of Labour editor or Labour correspondent, which used to be one of the key jobs on a newspaper 20 years ago, is now almost defunct. I think probably is defunct. The last, the last um, journalist of that title on a national paper, Barry Clement, uh, has just retired. Um, uh, now, part of the reason, of course, is that the trade unions are, frankly, less powerful than they were um, than in the 1970s. Um, uh, uh, they are smaller in size, although, of course, they've gone back up again a bit recently. Um, and they have less power to, to affect the lives of ordinary newspaper readers in the way that they once did by, you know, withdrawing their labour or whatever, because um, they do that far less often than they used to. However, that shouldn't mean that trade unions are ignored. What's, what it does mean, though, is I think trade unions have got to accept they haven't got a right to coverage. They have to work for their coverage. And they have to do some of the things that I was talking about. Um, they, they have to set themselves up a little bit more like Migration Watch in media terms. Um, trade unions aren't always particularly brilliant at um, communicating with the media. Now, they actually, I mean, they still have resources. They still have staff. They, they could do this if they wanted to. It wouldn't, you know, they, they've got the money and the, the, and the people. They need to have, like, spin doctors almost. They need to have Andrew Green type figures who can, who can be constantly available to be called on when you know, an event comes up. And they will be called on if, you know, to give you an example, I mean, they, if they can present themselves as representatives of broader interests, like in health stories, I'm struck by the fact there's a huge amount of interest in health, a huge amount of concern about what's going on in the NHS. I'm struck by how seldom trade union voices find their way into that coverage. Um, and yet they represent the workers in the health service. They know things. And, and, and the way to, to prize yourself in that coverage, you've got to, you know, the health unions have got to have a, a spokesman who can be available for the, for the media, and they've got to have stories. You've got to kind of think, you know, you, you've got the best sources in the world. You've got your members at the, at the coalface, and they can tell you what's really going on. And you've got to be able to produce an alternative narrative for the media to, 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 to give it to them and, you know, to say actually, well, what the government's saying isn't right. And, you've, and that means 
organizing. It means organizing in a different way. Um, it, it, you, know, you need to set up an intelligence network. You, just, you need to tell shop stewards, if you've got a story, tell me. You know, here, here's, here's, here's my phone number. Here's a, here's a line you can call. Here's an email address you can send to. And then we'll get some publicity for it and we'll get, we'll get it changed because that can be more effective sometimes in traditional, than traditional means, particularly given the um, kind of legal constraints we've been talking about. And, and that's, you know, Trade unions need to reorganise themselves a bit for the information age because the old, like I said, the old means of pressure. Um, I mean, I, I think I think withdrawal of labour is is still the most important thing because it's, but it's it's a big step. It's a nuclear option. It can go very badly wrong. Um, so there are there are lots of other things we can do, and, and trade unions are still, I think, slightly too locked in the traditional uh, mode of operating. So it's not hopeless, but it just needs a bit of work and it needs a bit more um, a bit more imagination on on, on unions' part. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Um, I'm a journalism student. Um, I've sat here and listened to everything you said tonight, and you painted a really bleak sort of picture on the future of British journalism. Oh <laughs> it's not that bad. Uh, so, well, I was just wondering, do you have anything reassuring to say? Because, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> already you're talking about sort of um, the state controlling what we print, journalists being arrested, and we're even talking about sort of withholding labour and not working. So, I mean, I know, do no, have no, a future? I know, no, no, I don't know. I mean... Um, Okay, I mean, it's still, uh, like I said, I mean, it still can be an incredible, well, it is an incredibly powerful force. In lots of ways, the media are, are the most powerful force in civil society, which is something I, I, I did say. Um, and, and in, you know, as other institutions of civil society have withered a bit, like trade unions, obviously they are still very important, but they are not as important as they were, the media has come to sort of fill the vacuum a bit. Um, so actually, if it's done properly, it can still be amazingly powerful and important. And, and it's like I say, I mean, you know, I, I mean, my message would hopefully be, and I hope this has come across, but, you know, you don't, don't despair. There are just, you've got to get round, you've got to organise in different ways. There are enormous, enormous opportunities and enormous possibilities to influence public debate um, through, through media organisations of the kind, through media organisations of the kind we've, we've discussed, through through, through, through the media, and if you're working in the media, there's still an enormous amount of um, there's still an enormous amount of good that you can do, an enormous amount of stuff you can do. Frankly, I mean, I'll say this: I mean, you know, it's not just a problem for um, for employers. Um, it's not just a problem of, of, of greedy, uh, uh, grasping employers who don't want to invest in journalism. It's also a fact that lots of journalists aren't actually, you know, particularly energetic themselves. Quite a lot of journalists are quite lazy. Quite a lot of journalists are people like. Um, you know, Con Coughlin, who would just take take whatever bollocks was given him by the security services and put it in the paper. Um, um, you know, that um, that there is still one of the things I one of the uh, nice things I found when I went into journalism. And I thought when I started my first job in uh, Fleet Street was on the Sunday Telegraph, and um, and uh, and I thought, you know, am I going to be able to cope? Is it going to be all right? You know, is it they're going to be all incredibly high powered, and it's going to be, you know, I'm going to, you know, they're all going to be incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly clued in. It wasn't like that at all, actually. Um, they were quite clever, most of them, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't stratospherically clever. Um, uh, and actually, if you're any good at all, you really can shine in journalism. You really can. Anyway, that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you very much.